Oklahoma Gardening is a production of the Oklahoma Cooperative Extension Service as part of the land-grant mission of the Division of Agricultural Sciences and Natural Resources at Oklahoma State University, dedicated to improving the quality of life of the citizens of Oklahoma through research-based information. Southwood Landscape and Garden Center, Tulsa's source for great gardens, southwoodgardencenter.com, and the Oklahoma Department of Agriculture, Food, and Forestry, helping to keep Oklahoma green and growing. Today on Oklahoma Gardening, host Casey Hinches takes a look at the brand new Tahoma 31 Bermuda grass with OSU Extension Turf Grass Specialist Justin Moss. And we come to the final stops on our tour of gardening in northwest Oklahoma with a hike up Black Mesa to explore the wide variety of native plants in the far corner of the state. And a visit to the Selman Bat Cave in Freedom, Oklahoma, where the sky is filled with flapping wings. release and joining me is Dr. Justin Moss, OSU Turfgrass Extension Specialist. Dr. Moss, this is it. it. It's beautiful. This is it. This is our latest release from the Oklahoma State University Bermuda Grass Breeding Team. World renowned breeding team. Yeah, I say. so you guys have yeah. grass all over the world. All I know. over the world. So Dr. Yang Chi Wu is our breeder and Dr. Dennis Martin, our turf extension specialist, does a lot of the work on this and then folks like myself we look at how they tolerate stress and Dr. Charles Fontenier as well as Dr. Nathan Walker and Dr. Eric Rebeck so it's a big we, team making team. this happen yeah. yeah we look at everything and so this is the latest and greatest it's called Tahoma 31 Bermuda grass okay and so what makes it so great hey Tahoma 31 is just beautiful so that's that's probably the the, the first thing is it has excellent turf grass quality what is that that just means it's it's, it's a beautiful green color, it's nice and dense, and it grows quite well in our environment. And so what happens with these grasses is our, our breeder, Dr. Wu, will develop several different experimental genotypes, and we kind of test them and narrow them down. We might start with thousands of plants, right. and eventually, over many, many years, get down to that one or two. You know? Yeah, and this is the one that this made is the, the cut. One. That's this exciting. Is the one. Now, I know Northbridge and Latitude 36 were touted as being very cold tolerant. How does uh, Tacoma add into that? So, yes, La uh, Latitude 36, Northbridge, excellent cold tolerance. Tahoma does as well. Tahoma is probably a notch above those, though. And the other thing that uh, Tahoma has, which they don't, is excellent drought resistance. Now, Latitude 36 and Northbridge are Bermuda grasses, so mm -hmm. just genetically speaking, they're going to have very good drought resistance. But when you directly compare Tahoma 31 to those other two grasses, basically this one's, it, when it quits raining in July and August right. and, and it gets really hot and dry. And you know, also when we're on water rationing. And when we're on water too. rationing, yeah. Tahoma 31 is going to stay green a little bit longer okay. compared to those other ones. Okay. And so, th so this one actually has excellent drought resistance as well as the excellent cold tolerance. And what's neat about this grass is, is we didn't just test it here in Oklahoma. Mm -hmm. So, so this went out to what's called the National Turf Grass Evaluation Program. And that's a program run out of uh, an office in Washington, D.C. And so they actually will collect experimentals from different universities, different companies that want them to be tested. And then they contract with the universities all across the United States to uh, test these grasses for five years. So this just, they don't just look at it one season or two seasons. You know, this is a five-year long test for these. And Tahoma 31 consistently at all those universities consistently raked at or near the top in all those tests over those five years. And so that's why this one has come out as a winner. It's not just because we at Oklahoma State think it's, it's really good and well adapted, but it actually performed well all across the United States. That's fantastic. If I'm a new homeowner and maybe I've just built a house and I'm looking to put in a new lawn, or yeah. maybe I have an existing lawn that's already Bermuda grass, why would I maybe not go with the cheaper option, yeah, right. the common Bermuda grass. I mean, Bermuda grass, as we know, grows great in Oklahoma. That's right. So you can get what, what's uh, commonly called common Bermuda grass pretty cheap in Oklahoma. So that's Cynodon This is a hybrid, so it's actually a combination of two different species. Uh, the common Bermuda grass, Cynodon but also African Bermuda grass, 
sighted on transvalensis. And just overall, the, the hybrids are going to have a, usually a finer leaf texture and a, and a better look to them, basically, when, when we look at them visually, they're more appealing to our eye. Right. And so it has better overall, excellent turf quality. But also, compared to those common Bermuda grasses, this one's going to have that cold tolerance improved and drought resistance improved. So you might so, save on the water bill, too, a little so bit. You might. And you're just going to have an overall better product. Okay. And actually, if we, if we can walk over and, and just, just kind of look mm -hmm. at, at this area of the lawn here, and, and this, is a, this is actually a homeowner's this, lawn. Exactly, yeah. a homeowner's yeah. lawn that we did a demo in. Yeah. And we put another uh, uh, experimental grass here. They've, they've been treated the same. Which has and, really been low maintenance, It's really been low, right? low to no maintenance. <laughs> low input, yeah. And you can really see the difference. That now there's, there's no difference in how these two sides were treated, but, but you can see the, the Tahoma 31 is nice and dense and green and not very many weeds. Yeah. Where this other experimental grass here, that it's one of ours, one of our OSU grasses. It, it's not going to make the cut probably, right? right? But treated the same and, and just, it's, it's a little, not quite as dense and, and vigorous. And, and a lot of weeds know, here. Yeah, there's definitely more weeds. weeds here. So yeah. is that just because it's got a thinner open canopy That's to it? That's right. Versus and so, and so your common Bermuda grasses, like we were talking about, are going to have canopies more open like this one does. And the nice thing about the Toma 31 is you can use it in a lawn, but you can also use it like at uh, NFL stadiums. You oh, can wow. use it at Major League Baseball okay. stadiums. And it is being used in those cases so and being installed in very high profile locations. So it definitely handles more wear and tear. It can it can definitely handle some wear and tear. So that's where for sure. can homeowners find this grass and can you do it through seed or only through sod? Yeah this is only through sod because it is that hybrid and um, what's neat about this is it's been released through Oklahoma State University mm -hmm. and a company called Sod Production Services out of Virginia okay. has obtained the license to it and so we have uh, uh, so they're the ones that are actually responsible to sub-license to sod growers across the United States or even in other countries for that matter. And so they have sub-licensed Toma 31 to uh, uh, currently Sod by Sherry and Riverview Sod Ranch. And so it can be purchased uh, in spring of 2019 in Oklahoma, whether that's for uh, you know the sports field situation or the golf course situation or even the homeowner situation. So. All right. Well, thanks for sharing this information. I know it was a team of people that finally uh, came up with this conclusion of this grass, and it looks great. Hey, it's a team effort and also uh, working with our industry partners and our sod growers uh, to get this product out to homeowners and consumers. here with Amy Buteau, who's with the Oklahoma Biological Survey, and we are at the base of Black Mesa, just north of Kenton, Oklahoma, and basically as far west in the panhandle of Oklahoma as you can get. In fact, we're on mountain time out here. And Amy, we came out to talk a little bit about the ecology that you see here. Can you tell me about what's going on behind us? Well, Casey, as you said, we are at the base of Black Mesa here in Cimarron County. <laughs> this is the short grass prairie. We're kind of gradually in edging into a, pin a pinion juniper woodland. Uh, the juniper here is not the eastern red cedar that most of your viewers are probably familiar with. And they look with. very similar. They but... do look very similar. Uh, the differences are minute. You have to look at the little leaves under a scope and things like that. Really, really picky botany type stuff. <laughs> uh, it also sort of has a different growth form, as you can see, more bushy. Okay. Uh, we also have pinyon pine here, which is obviously not in the rest of the state. This is the only place in Oklahoma where pinyon grows. As we go further up the mesa, we will see more of that. Okay. Uh, so we have the one-seeded juniper and the pinyon pine here. And you touched on some of the grasses. We have one of those grasses here in front of us. Uh, a lot of us as horticulturists and gardeners know this as uh, a blonde ambition cultivar, but this is the native uh, blue grandma grass. Yes, correct? this is Budalua gracilis or okay. blue grandma grass. It is actually pretty much one of the dominants here where we're standing. 
and it looks just lovely out here. It's a nice wispy grass. It's a beautiful grass. So let's talk a little bit about some of the other forbs that we're seeing around here. One that's catching our eye right away is this, it's a Senecio. This is a Senecio. This is the thread leaf ragwort, Senecio flaccidus. And as you can see, it's more of a shrubby type plant, mm -hmm. uh, beautiful blue green foliage. I think it would look great in the garden. I don't know if it's in cultivation, but I would certainly want it in my garden. Yeah. And in fact, there's some other composite fl uh, plants that we're seeing around here. There's a couple of daisies, and I think I even saw the chocolate daisy. Is that correct? It is. It is. This is Berlandiera lyrata, or uh, another name, name for it is lyre leaf green eyes. It's a member. It kind of has this sort of look after the petals fall off. It right? is. It is. Yeah, that's exactly why. Uh, it does smell like chocolate, as you mentioned it, specifically the center part right here when it's fresh. It has just this odd chocolate-like aroma. Mm -hmm. It does. It smells a little cocoa-like. It's really nice. It's a beautiful plant. I like how the rays underneath are sort of purple with mm -hmm. little stripes. Yeah, and so the sepals then give it that green eyes common name. Indeed. And they actually kind of dry nicely as well, too, there. They do. They do. And I think they seed well as well. Excellent. All right. So we've got a few succul succulents around here, too. Uh, we've got some yucca. And is this just our, our common yucca that we have here? Or? Yes. This is yucca glauca or the soapweed glauca, glauca. Another name is Spanish bayonet. And if you touch the end, you can see why it is named that because it is very sharp. <laughs> yeah. And yeah, actually right here, it's kind of prickly. So... Ouch. Anyway, it's one of our succulent plants. But it's not the only one. We've got prickly pears and choyas out here. Can you tell us a little bit about those? Uh, this is actually an Apuntia, an Apuntia species or a prickly pear. Black Mesa has about four different species of prickly pears. And we also have the tree choya, which is actually a cylindropuntia. Uh, you can see in the background, it makes nice yellow fruits. And this is a plant that's actually becoming more and more common out here at Black Mesa. Years ago, you wouldn't see this much tree choya. This is actually a result of overgrazing. Oh, really? Okay. Yes, cattle have come in and eaten the grasses. Obviously, they don't want to eat the tree choya, so consequently, you have more tree choya. All right. So Amy, it looks like here we have got some of that dead choya actually. And I think a lot of the homeowners use this in their landscape, but might not realize that it comes from the choya plant. This is the dried skeleton, if you will, basically. It is, it's really cool looking. And I know I have some mixed in with my sedums at home. But what is surrounding this? It looks like an aster. I mean, it's a gorgeous little plot here. It's not technically an aster. Okay. Um, it's common name, has the word aster <laughs> in it, but you know, scientific names and all. Uh, this is the tansy leaf tansy aster. Okay. A uh, very beautiful plant. It's common out here. It blooms pretty much throughout the growing season from uh, May through, you know, first frost. I even looked this morning and I saw a record from Cimarron County from January, oh, wow. if you can believe that. Wow. Uh, beautiful plant. So I, reseeding perennial? I think it is. Okay. I believe it is. Yes. All right. And then we have a little purple sneak in here that is Looks like our regular verbena. And that, that we it often is. See. That is common out here in the short grass prairie. Okay. And here in our grasses, our, our galardia. We can't get very far without keep seeing different plants here. Nope, nope. This, believe it or the not, yellow galardia. is a galardia well, related to the, the blanket flower that most of us know. This one is different in that its leaves are dissected or mm -hmm. pinnate, as we say. Uh, the common name, I believe, is red dome blanket flower. Wonder where it gets that name. Don't know. <laughs> Beautiful plant. All right, and we've seen a few other plants along the way. There was a sand lily. Tell us a little bit about that plant. The it's got sand, a beautiful white flower. It is. Uh, I didn't realize it, but I guess that flower opens up in the afternoon. We drove through uh, to Kenton and saw fields and fields of it. Absolutely gorgeous. It has a lot of a lot of stamens, so it gives this kind of lacy look. Uh, it's got really sticky leaves and you know, they'll stick to your clothes, they'll go through the wash, you can't get rid of them. But it's a beautiful plant. <laughs> but not sticky in the fact like a, a, like a succulent no, that might no, stab you or something, no. a cactus. More, more like a Velcro that gotcha. will never go away. Right. And then the zinnia that the, we saw. The zinnia, we actually have a native zinnia here in Oklahoma. It is the Rocky Mountain zinnia. It forms these beautiful golden mounds. Uh, it's a plant that I believe would probably work really well in a rock garden. Very short profile. Very yeah. short, very kind of prostrate plant, um, beautiful. Excellent.
So Amy, we're in a different location. We're now at the Etling Lake in the Black Mesa State Park, just a little bit further from the actual Black Mesa. And so being in a more wet condition, we're finding a few different plants here. Yes, yes. This pretty guy is the copper globe mallow. It's actually in the same family as hibiscus. Uh -huh. And if you look closely at the flower, that is quite evident. Oh yeah, definitely has a mallow-like flower to it. This is a beautiful plant and I wish I had it in my garden. I love the color of it. Yeah, it's a nice color here. It's a really unique color for a flower, right. I would think. I normally don't see that. <laughs> so, and it looks like pollinators are enjoying it yes, quite a bit are. too. Yes, they are. They are. So we mentioned the, how important the grasses are to the short grass prairie, but we hear about old world blue stem a lot, and I know we have some of it here. Can you tell us a little bit about old world blue stem versus some of the other grasses we might find around here? Old world blue stem, which is this fellow right here, is an exotic invasive grass that is found in Oklahoma. Uh, as we drove into the park, you could see it all along the roadsides. Uh, I believe it was brought in for cattle, and, you know, as so many things do, it escaped. You can tell Old World blue stem apart from our native silver blue stem by its inflorescence. Old World blue stem has these little individual fingers that you could sort of pull apart and see. Little, little wavy fingers. Whereas our silver blue stem, is which is right me? next to you, doesn't have those little fingers. It has little tiny branches, but they're kind of stubby and they just don't really make you think of fingers. And plus it's really kind of fuzzy and white. Mm -hmm. Again, this is a native species, but it is also found in sort of degraded areas, uh, like pastures and overgrazed sort of places. And, and there's some other plants that we might see around here. You mentioned some buckwheats. Can you tell us about the buckwheats that we might find around here? The buckwheats are the genus Eriogonum, which is a really, really large genus as you move towards the west. There are about 250 species. Uh, there are two that are more common in the body of the state that we're used to, but out here you get some really, really neat ones. They're little mat forming plants and they grow up on the rocks. And they're, they're really, really beautiful little plants. They're just unique in their own special way. And I'm not quite sure if anybody grows them for gardens, but I think that they would probably look really nice in a rock garden. Yeah, it, it seems like they can really handle those conditions pretty definitely, well. Definitely, definitely. Well, Amy, this has just been fantastic. We've enjoyed walking around well, and exploring the native areas with a, a botanist and, and seeing your hand lens out and looking at some <laughs> of the plants a little closer. So thank you for sharing this information with us. Well, thank you for having me. I appreciate it. Selman Bat Caves just outside of Freedom, Oklahoma. And joining me today is Melinda Hickman, who is a biologist for the Oklahoma Department of Wildlife Conservation. And Melinda, tell us why we're here. I'm so excited. <laughs> There's bats. <laughs> there, there are bats. Uh, this is an amazing area. You are in what's called the mixed grass uh -huh. prairie region. So we have short grasses and tall grasses. But as you can see behind us, we have this, this gypsum topography uh -huh. and because we have caves we have bats here in this particular area. Okay and we don't just have any normal bat here. Oh heck no. Right what bat is it that we're <laughs> looking at? That we're we'll looking up? at the Mexican free-tailed bat uh -huh. which is a migratory bat so it does not hibernate here in Oklahoma. Okay. It actually flies up from believe it or not Mexico uh -huh. uh, to come up and and, and breed and give birth to pups and then the pups fly and then they start to work their way back south. They are following insects. Now all the bats that are here are actually female, is that correct? They are okay. all females and not only are they all females, they were pregnant when they came to the Selman Bat Cave. Okay. And they, there's an amazing courtship that takes place as the male and females migrate north mm -hmm. and it's in fact it's the first they've been apart for a whole year the poor males and females <laughs> and but as they start migration they're together again and a lot of courtship goes on a lot of mating um, about the middle of Texas all of that changes the females that are pregnant continue migrating 
generally speaking, they will return to the cave from which they were born. Okay. And the males are footloose and fancy free for a whole nother year. To continue on. Yeah, absolutely. And so in six to seven weeks, you've got this, um, this amazing emergence of females and the pups. And here we have over a million Mexican free tail bats. That's a lot of bats. It's a lot of bats. Place. So <laughs> we typically see them come out at dusk. Yes. Right. So or a um, little bit or a later before, or yeah, a little early. <laughs> yeah. So we try to time it about the right time. Yes. Um, and how long will that? Uh, last as they come out of the cave? Well, we we have been watching this for more than 20 years now, and when the pups, well, all the pups are flying, mm -hmm. it takes more than 45 minutes for them to all come out. Wow. And when you see how thick they are, yeah. and you do some uh, math, mm -hmm. and 45 minutes of that, it is a lot of right, bats. Right. And it almost looks like smoke the way it they're does. coming out, and like a school of fish, basically. <laughs> oh, very aquatic. Yeah, okay, yeah. good. <laughs> yes. So Melinda, when they start coming out of here, do they always go in the same direction? And what are they looking for? Insects, okay. I'm guessing. <laughs> uh, yes, definitely insects. Uh, they, they really will vary their pattern, and it's all about the moisture in the area surrounding. Mesonet okay. helps us uh, look at, there's three different stations. We can look at where the moisture level is, the highest level, and almost always the bats will head in that direction okay. because the insects that they really love are caught up in the, the higher elevations where that moisture is being worked on. Okay. So uh, because they hunt so high, they are eating beetles and they're eating moths oh. primarily. Okay. So unfortunately, they're not the bats that are eating the mosquitoes right. because they're not coming down <laughs> low enough. But we do have a lot of bats that are in Oklahoma that do. Yeah. But these these guys are eating those moths that are a real problem for agriculture, for um, our farmers who are growing corn in particular, the mm -hmm. corn earworm, okay. nasty, nasty pest. And that's what these guys love. Oh, excellent. So you mentioned we have other bats in the state. Now, this is kind of unique to the state in the fact that it's such a mass population. Absolutely. But we have a lot of other bats across we the did. state. Just How many? Oklahoma is so diverse in wildlife and plants. We have 24 different species and subspecies of bats that use Oklahoma at some point in their in their annual cycle. Okay. Melinda, I know a lot of homeowners, you know, people might be scared if they see bats around. What should they do if they see them or what should they think about them? Well, they should be really glad that they're there. Okay. Um, they are eating the mosquitoes that we don't like, the bugs that bother us in our gardens. What, for Oklahoma, we have a few bats that are found all over the state, and they're the ones that like to be in our neighborhoods. Okay. And they like trees. And our most common is the eastern red bat. And if you've ever seen the red coloration on a, on a red fox, mm -hmm. same, same beautiful okay. red color. And she hangs up in your tallest tree during the day, usually cottonwoods, sycamores. Are they a solitary bat then? Or? They are solitary. Okay. They're not colonial like our okay. Mexican free tail bats. So this is open to the public to come out. How, how does a, a person come and view these bats? Okay, so we have what we call the Selman Bat Watches, mm -hmm. and they take place in the month of July, you know, the hottest time of the year. <laughs> but that's when the, the females, the moms, and the, and the pups are fine, so it makes a really large, extravagant spectacle. Um, and to, to, to do that, you actually have to enter a, a registration form by mail, mm -hmm. And there's a registration period, but it always starts the Tuesday following the Monday Memorial Day. Okay. And it's about 10 business days to get your registration form in. It doesn't matter if you got it in the beginning of the period or after, because when that period is over, we actually conduct a drawing. Uh -huh. And there's a preference point to it. Okay. If you have tried and didn't get to go, your, your preference is higher. Okay. But if you've been in the past, then it's going to be lower okay. because we're trying to give everyone the opportunity. Mm -hmm. But unfortunately, it just happens in the month of July. And only for a few nights a week, correct? It's two uh, the Friday and Saturday, okay. the four weekends following the 4th of July holiday. Okay. Well, Melinda, thank you oh, for sharing this with us. And let's sit so back exciting. and watch some bats, let's shall do. we? Let's do. Let's do.
And as we wrap up our Northwest regional tour, we want to say thank you to all the people that we met along the way and those who opened their home, their backyards, and their businesses to us. Without their generosity, we wouldn't be able to bring you the diversity that we experienced on this regional trip. And to our viewers, we want to thank you for joining along with us on our regional tour, and we hope that you take time to come explore Northwestern Oklahoma. There are lots of great horticultural events this time of year. Be sure and consider these activities when you're making your plans for the weeks ahead. Next week, we dig in to what's been happening with our Hugo culture. Casey helps protect our pets from poisonous plants. And we meet a group of undergraduate students from colleges around the state who spent last summer working on their own horticultural research projects at Oklahoma State University. We hope you join us then for more TV You'll Grow to Love. To find out more information about show topics, as well as recipes, videos, articles, fact sheets, and other resources, including a directory of local extension offices, be sure and visit our website, oklamagarding.okstate.edu. And we always have great information, answers to questions, photos, and gardening discussions on your favorite social media as well. Join in on Facebook, Twitter, and Instagram. You can find this entire show and other recent shows, as well as individual segments on our Oklahoma Gardening YouTube channel. And tune in to our OK Gardening Classics YouTube channel to watch segments from previous hosts. Oklahoma Gardening is produced by the Oklahoma Cooperative Extension Service as part of the Division of Agricultural Sciences and Natural Resources at Oklahoma State University. The Botanic Garden at OSU is home to our studio gardens and we encourage you to come visit this beautiful Stillwater Jewel. We wish to thank our generous underwriters, Southwood Landscape and Garden Center, and the Oklahoma Department of Agriculture, Food, and Forestry. Additional support is provided by Pond Pro Shops, Greenleaf Nursery and the Garden Debut Plants, and the Oklahoma Horticultural Society.